I'm in Managua, Nicaragua with my friend Ben Norton, who is a journalist with The Gray Zone. He lives here in Nicaragua, and it's a very exciting week. Tell us a little bit about the celebrations and the significance of what's going to take place on January 10th. Well, January 10th is the inauguration of President and Comandante Daniel Ortega, the leader of the Sandinista Front, a historic revolutionary figure who helped to lead the Sandinista Revolution in 1979. The Sandinistas did lose power in 1990, but they came back through democratic elections in 2006 and have governed since 2007. And in November, the Sandinista Front won the election and January 10th is the inauguration day. And it's an exciting time, not only because it is a further sign of the strength of the Sandinista Front, which is one of the largest leftist movements in Latin America and all of Latin America, even though Nicaragua was a relatively small country in terms of the region, only 6.5 million people, but the Sandinista Front has millions of supporters, it has hundreds of thousands of militants, of activists, and it has a mass base that has shown support for the president and for the government. And it's an exciting time because geopolitically, Nicaragua is also playing a key role. So not only has the government implemented an ambitious program of electrification, free universal health care, creating water, potable water systems, which is a major issue. When the Sandinistas came back to power in 2007, there were major problems. There was illiteracy, a lack of access to clean water, a lack of access to electricity. Everything was privatized, including the water system, including the health system. When Ortega came back in 2007, immediately he inaugurated a system of universal health care, free universal health care, of free universal education, including at the college level and other programs, including housing programs. All of those programs are continuing, they're expanding, and geopolitically, Nicaragua has started really punching above its weight. We see that Nicaragua, this December, reestablished re diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, and it's widely suspected that the government is going to re restart construction on an interoceanic canal that will be built by China, along with the help of Nicaragua, of course, and that this is a joint project. It's an example of South-South cooperation. It's an example of win-win cooperation. It's mutually beneficial for both countries and can challenge the monopoly of the Panama Canal, which is dominated by the U.S. government politically. Panama has never really been able to exercise independent political sovereignty. So there's, it's a very interesting moment in Nicaragua domestically, there's a lot of enthusiasm about the popular projects. The housing, public housing project, which is called the Proyecto Bismarck Martinez, is growing. They, last year alone, they built 3,000 houses, and they're building more. And these are houses for poor and working Nicaraguans. They're continuing their goal to move toward 100% electrification, which they're likely going to meet very soon. They're, they're moving toward their goal of 100% access to potable water. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things happening. And for me as a, as a foreigner, what's interesting especially is the geopolitical role that Nicaragua is starting to play. Like I said, even though this is a small country, it has been part of this axis of resistance along with Venezuela, along with Cuba, and working more and more with China, with Russia, with Iran, Nicaragua, the, the President Ortega and the President of Iran, Raisi, recently had a, a meeting, or rather a um, phone call, like a virtual meeting, I guess they call these days, and they discussed ways to increase collaboration. So I, I think it's, it's a really interesting time, and a lot of people are expecting that January 10th can, can represent a new phase of further radicalization of the Sandinista Revolution. Yeah, and what capacity would you say uh, the Sandinista government and the Nicaraguan people have to resist uh, the unilateral course of measures of the United States? Because we saw in November, the last time I was here, that the Renaissance Act was unfortunately shamefully passed, which means more sanctions on Nicaragua. But this is a country which, of course, is known for food sovereignty, so they won't be able to starve the Nicaraguan population uh, to death or into submission. But um, at the same time, with all of these uh, you know, partnerships and cooperation with other countries. It's not just China, which is in the news, but many other countries. Um, you know, will they even have the same effect as they, as we saw them have on Venezuela a few years ago? 
Well, the answer is clearly no. I mean, you mentioned something very important, which is the role of food sovereignty. And this is something new in the neoliberal era, as we see constantly when there's right-wing governments in power, they are vende patrias, selling their homeland to foreign capital, to North American corporations. And in the neoliberal era in Nicaragua, we saw domestic food production decrease and an increasing reliance on imports. When the Sandinistas came back, Part of their program I didn't mention, which is very important, one of the most important parts, is also land redistribution, giving land deeds to poor and working people, and especially to campesinos, because a lot of campesinos, a lot of farmers in Nicaragua and across Latin America, they often live and work on lands that they don't have a, a physical deed to. So in, in a country like Colombia, for instance, where there are these far-right paramilitary groups which are linked to the government, linked to leaders like Alvaro Uribe, and are hired by corporations, they will frequently kill and violently force campesinos off of their lands. And because the campesinos don't have the legal protections that are offered by a land deed, they can't defend their livelihood. So the, the Sandinistas have really prioritized that. Every year they give tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of land deeds to families. And their, I mentioned their public housing program and also redistributing land to farmers, allowing farmers to increase production so they don't have to rely on food imports. And Nicaragua produces almost 100% of its food. In fact, Nicaragua ironically exports food to countries, including the United States, including beef, including rice, including beans, which is an example. This, this very, very small country and relatively poor country or overexploited country with the colonial history of U.S. military occupations and all of that, it is able to produce the food it needs and then extra it's able to export that food so sanctions are not going to have the same impact on Nicaragua as they've had on a country like Venezuela which for its unique history it, it, it's a problem that very much predates Chavismo and the Bolivarian Revolution for a hundred years Venezuela has been reliant on oil exports and food imports so we've seen that Nicaragua in that sense is sanctions proof and I mentioned again the key role of geopolitics Nicaragua it's very exciting, frankly, to me and to a lot of Nicaraguans. It is part of an international movement of countries and peoples that are working together to resist U.S. sanctions, to resist U.S. imperialism, to resist, resist this dictatorship led by Washington and its junior partners in crime and, and Canada and, Euro and the European Union and Britain who think they can just bully the entire world around and think they can impose sanctions and force countries to their knees. And we've seen that Nicaragua at the United Nations and international institutions like the CELAC, which today, January 7th, is having a meeting in Argentina, and the foreign minister, Denis Moncada, is there, working with other countries in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean. We've seen that Nicaragua is part of this movement to build new economic structures through things like the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA, so they can get around U.S. sanctions, so they can do trade with their neighbors in Latin America and the Caribbean, and they don't need North American corporations. They don't need European corporations. They're also working, I mentioned, with China and Russia, especially with China on, on ambitious infrastructure projects to develop the region. So, I mean, Nicaragua is really punching above its weight. And Nicaragua is one of two dozen countries that is part of this new organization, this new alliance at the UN, which is called the Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter, which consists really, like I said, of the, the axis of resistance, including Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, also St. Vincent and the Grenadines, also Eritrea, and also China and Russia and Palestine and Iran and Syria. So we're seeing it as the U.S. accelerates its aggression, we're also seeing that countries around the world are refusing to just sit idly and take that, those attacks on the cheek. Instead, they are collaborating, they're working together and building new political and economic infrastructure that will make U.S. sanctions irrelevant. Yeah, one of the things I heard um, that I've heard around here from a lot of different Nicaraguans is that they say that the Sandinista government has, throughout this entire process of governance, had so much foresight. Um, you know, obviously, 
uh, Danielle, Comandante Danielle, is getting a little older, um, but there's a lot of renewal within the Sandinista, Revolu the Sandinista Front, uh, within the party. There's also a lot of very young people, as we know, um, in the ministries and in his government, but he himself has been uh, credited by Nicaraguans for the way he's handled a number of things, um, and al also um, specifically for knowing what the enemy is going to do next, thinking about what, um, you know, what the U.S. Empire, how they might strike against Nicaragua and preparing for that. Um, it's just a very exciting time. The Gray Zone was one of the only outlets in 2018 that was telling the truth about what was going on here when the terrorist violence was taking place in a failed uh, a coup attempt. Um, and so this was very important coverage that we saw only on really Telesur, the Gray Zone, Tortilla Consal, and some very important work done by Alliance for Global Justice. So it's very important that people see how many people are excited about this um, celebration, this inauguration that's going to take place on January 10th. And we're seeing social movements and members of political parties and governments from all over the world coming here to take part in that. Um, it's absolutely just um, going to be a huge event. And you said something very exciting. Uh, well, it tends to be exciting when these um, inaugurations take place because sometimes you said they make an announcement. Yeah, well, I mean, we can only speculate, but every at every inauguration, El Comandante Ortega and La Compañera Rosario Murillo, who's the vice president, and also plays an important role in a lot of these projects that you mentioned, especially in encouraging youth and encouraging women. W women represent half of the Sandinista government, half of the Nicaraguan government, because under the leadership of Comandante Daniel and La, La Compañera Rosario, they created laws that mandate half of government roles to be filled by women. So, I mean, it's really a kind of dynamic duo partnership working together. And at every inauguration, both of them, they always announce a new ambitious project. So when Comandante Daniel returned to power in 2007, it was a project of mass electrification and free universal health care and education. And in the constitution of Nicaragua, under the Sandinistas, 6% of the government spending, the government budget, is dedicated exclusively to public education. And it cannot be changed. It has to be at least 6% of the national budget. Whereas in the U.S., it's something like 50 plus for just the military, for war. So in his first inauguration, he made that announcement. And in subsequent inaugurations, he made those announcements. And we don't know exactly what the announcement will be. There's speculation that he could say potentially something about reconstructing, restarting construction on the interoceanic canal that I mentioned. That's speculation, but we'll see. But it's a very exciting time. And I think he really hit the nail on the head that... The Sandinistas, again, although they don't have many resources, although Nicaragua is a small country, they have had really a brilliant strategy for moving forward. And there were a lot of people who criticized the Sandinistas when they came back to power in 2007, claiming that they made all these compromises. And, and they had to make some compromises because they were working within the confines of bourgeois democracy. They had to win these bourgeois elections and all of that. And they have gradually, it sounds kind of strange, but they have actually gradually implemented a revolutionary program. Instead of doing it immediately, they have implemented it over years, over nearly two decades now. And there's every sign that they're going to continue, as I said, radicalizing the revolution. It doesn't just stay static. So I mentioned the creation of universal health care and education. Well, they've also been recently doing things like expanding taxation, expropriation. So I think we're really going to see a new phase of the revolution that is represented by this inauguration. And like I said, it has this geopolitical element as well. As the US empire attacks, Nicaragua continues to respond. And it's not just responding with its domestic policies, it's responding by allying with very significant powers and telling Washington that we are not standing alone. We are part of an international movement. And that's what's, the last thing I'll say here is what's so impressive to me about this, this movement in Nicaragua and so inspiring being a foreigner born and raised in the United States is that, like I said, this is a small country in Central America with 6.5 million people. And when you compare it to its neighbors, which unfortunately, not because of the fall of the peoples, but because of the fall of their governments and because of the U.S. meddling that has destabilized countries like Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala, 
these are countries where a lot of people don't really have hope, and that's why they're being forced to leave their country and seek jobs and safety elsewhere, right? And now we see with Honduras that there might be a move back toward the left, but the reality is that Nicaragua not only is it an example for all Central America, I think it's an example for the world in a lot of ways that you don't need to have massive oil reserves. You don't need to have a huge country with hundreds of millions of people in order to affect international politics. And the Sandinista revolution understands that if you have the support of the majority of the people, which they do, not 100%, but probably three quarters, according to polls, 60 to 70%. And if you are strategic and it's also an example for a lot of people on the left who maybe have sometimes ultra leftist tendencies and they want every, everything to be as radical as possible. It's an example, if you take your time, if you play your cards strategically like a game of chess, then you can actually really punch above your weight and not only make life better for your population, but really help change global politics. And, and I think that's what Nick Rott was doing. You said it all. Thanks so much, Ben Norton, uh, journalist with The Gray Zone based here in Managua.